Welcome back to the Sports Max Zone. We turn our focus now to athletics and the 2016 Olympic 110 meter hurdles champion Omar McLeod has revealed he never felt appreciated by the Jamaica public following his gold medal performance in the 110 meter hurdles at the 2016 Rio Olympic Games and a 2017 World Championship in London. During an interview with uh, Inside Lane following his non-qualification for the Paris Olympic Games at the National Stadium at the Jamaica Trials this past weekend, an emotional McLeod said uh, Jamaica never made him feel like being an Olympic champion was a big deal. But I am writing my story you know, at the same time, and, and, and my story is only my story, and I, I, I'm going to do everything that I can to keep having fun with the sport and enjoying it and work, like I said, work my way to the top. However that may look, my top is this right here, showing up and running season bests. That's the top for me. You know, I've, 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 I'm grateful enough to have won it already. And, and that's a blessing that nobody can take away from, from, from me. And last year, it was the first time I actually, when I walked away from the sport, I actually was able to realize what I've done and the magnitude of what I've done. So because, the first attempt for you know, people never really made me feel like this was a big deal. I remember when I won in Olympics in 2016, I never really made they, I used to say, but my country never made me feel like it was a big deal. The, the people that I had around me never made me feel like it was a big deal. You know, so I had to walk away and really, I remember there was one day when I put the gold medal on my neck and I wore it for an entire day. And that was the first time I was like, I am an Olympic gold medal, you know, and I was able to revel in that. Um, that was very healing for me. That was very healing for me, you know, so um, that gave me so much perspective. And I was like, I've done it. I've done it. Be, be proud of yourself, you know. And, and that gave me so much fight to come back and just do it this from pure joy instead of trying to seek validation um, from nobody. I, 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 want, I validated myself. Yeah, that's 2016 Olympic 110 meter hurdles champion Omar McLeod. Also sprint hurdles 2017 world champion and 2016 world indoor champion in the 60 meter hurdles. Uh, talking about the ups and downs of his career. Now, on set with us now is distinguished Jamaican sport psychologist, Dr. Olivia Rose. Uh, Doc, uh, some very um, profound comments there from Omar McLeod. And he has had, in the past couple of years, difficulties off, off the track. Um, were these pronouncements by him surprising to you? And can you give us your take on what? this narrative is? Okay, so based on what would have been said by Omar himself and just observation, so this is not somebody that I know personally or work with professionally, um, it's not surprising and because he would have been through so many hurdles, literally and figuratively, um, and been resilient over the years, in 2018, at my own um, Sports Caribbean um, Psychological Association conference, I, I chose to honor an athlete. And at the time, in 2018, it was Omar. And this choice was very deliberate. In fact, yeah. I brought that with me. I yeah, found it this it morning is. when, when yeah. I was asked yes. to come in and set. And the date there says actually um, June 5, I think, 2018. Yeah. And the reason for the selection of um, Omar at the time was because of the disparaging comments that were thrown at him in, um, in, on social media and just how resilient he would have had to be yeah. to still uh, put on the, the colors that he would have and to represent not just himself but the country under those conditions and it's very important for us to be mindful of the athletes and their emotions and what they go through as well as um, how inconsiderate some of us can be towards them when they don't do what we think that they should have done not knowing that they want to do this for themselves. Yeah, and Olivia, in the capacity that you hold as a psychologist, and I know you've worked with many um, sporting bodies, teams, athletes before, 
I listened to Omar very, very carefully. And one of the things I got from it is that, you know, he didn't get the public acceptance that he would have expected for the level that he performed at the sport. And my question to you is whenever you deal with these athletes, and they're so blessed now to be able to have um, psychologists employed, how often or how much of a priority is it for you to ensure that the athletes don't depend on public acceptance? Because, I mean, even for people in the public space, like what I do on a daily basis, how important is it that you know you don't sit here and just wait on what the public thinks but recognize that your purpose is so much bigger than what the rest of the world thinks well that's the whole essence of working with somebody like myself or the services that i provide to athletes but at the end of the day or at the beginning of the, the day you still want to matter to people that you're representing and mattering is very important but we emphasize, and if you notice his language when he was talking, he said, my country did not yeah. give me the recognition that I, I thought Is I deserved, it? or right? But it, it moved from my country to I wore my medal um, for a day, and I, he did his own introspection, and over time realized that he's a big deal. And what was very good was at the end of the same interview, uh, the the interviewer said to him you are a big deal so yes it's good and we all encourage not just athletes but individuals on a whole to find that validation within self to build self um, but we operate or we don't operate in isolation of a culture agree and so it's important to feel like you matter and that you are a big deal and be told or reminded but we also operate here especially in Jamaica where we say we don't frighten, we're not yeah, frightened for nobody, that. and we're never frightened, but we are so frightened. And that's the irony of but it. But you have to tell and the rest of the you, Caribbean what frighten means. And then oh, <laughs> frighten is like, you know, we're not in awe of you and all of you, what yeah. you've done. We just see you as a regular person. Thank you so much. <laughs> right? and, and the thing is, that it's not just a regular thing, because when I go to other places outside of the Caribbean, it's a big deal. But I think part of that is, uh, what is intertwined is that, is the notion of remaining humble so much so that you don't recognize or acknowledge people's accomplishments. And it's important that we know that, how do you want to be made to feel by somebody else? That's a question. Yes. In fact, we've done, well, myself and Coach Gus Logie, we've just completed our book on mattering in Caribbean sport. And the element that I highlighted was of Jamaican Olympians from 1972 to the Tokyo 2020 Olympics. And we wanted to find out what does mattering look like to you? Because support can never be too much. And mm -hmm. there are some people that no matter what you do, they still won't feel that way. But that's not what Omar was saying, by the way. And what is important is for us to find out from the Olympians and athletes how do they want to matter and how do they want to be recognized? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Well, you just touched on a part that we're going to head into because on Zoom to add to the discussion is retired international cricketer from the legendary all-conquering West Indies team of the 1980s, coach, consultant, and author from Trinidad and Tobago, Augustin Gus Logie. Logie, along with Dr. Olivia Rose, co-authored the book Mattering in Caribbean Sport, which brings to life poignant stories from Jamaican track and field Olympians spanning the period from 1972, the Munich Olympics, to the 2020 Tokyo Olympic Games. These stories revealing the highs and lows of their journeys, emphasizing the importance of feeling valued beyond medals and records. Gus Logie, welcome to the Sportsmac Zone. Having listened to Omar McLeod's story, Gus, what, what can you add to this? I think, first of all, let me say thank you very much for the invitation, Lance, and to Dr. Olivia and um, Ms. Rammer. Rammer. Is it? Yes. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, and I know that this is a difficult time for all of us in the Caribbean with hurricane season and things like that. But um, yeah, it's, it, it brought some emotions back to me, Lance, um, in my own sphere as a former cricketer as well. And some of the, the challenges I myself went through. And I think it's not just about athletes. I think it's about people in general, how we treat people. People want to be valued. People want to be appreciated for whatever they bring to the table. You know, and I think sometimes we forget that. And, um, 
you know, and it's really sad to see such a, you know, young man uh, express those feelings because one of the things we talk about is sports, you know, what it can do for a nation. We talk about it unites a nation so much when we do positive things, when we say positive things, but it could also divide the nation when, you know, someone like that can come out and speak in such terms about not being appreciated or feeling valued for what he has achieved. And he has achieved a lot, you know, from his people. And it's not just the fans. And I think if the fans are just part of it. I think it's organizations as well. People who are in authority, these are some of the people that sometimes disappoints you, um, made much promises to you, and then at the end of the day, they just don't deliver on the promises for different reasons. So, yeah, it's, it's really touched some, some nerves for me listening to the young man. Yeah, and when I look back at your own career, Gus, uh, you know, it's well documented the success that you had with the legendary West Indies teams of the past. But in retirement, you've, you've coached. You've coached Trinidad and Tobago successfully. You've coached in Bermuda. You've coached in Canada and so on. And you were actually the coach of the West Indies team that won the ICC Champions Trophy in 2004. Um, a, a lot of your successes ha have come outside of your Trinidad and Tobago domestic domestic scene. Do do you feel that in TNT you are valued? Uh, do you feel that your country? I know you were awarded Sportsman of the Year. I think it was back in '88 or something. Um, do you feel that the country has 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 made you feel <laughs> like like a champion? That you, you know, are. But, you know, yeah, but basically, I'm, I'm like um, young McLeod in a way. I, I never look for that validation outside of my family. Let's put it this way. And I've had a very close knit family, uh, and my, uh, my relatives have always been supportive of me. That has been a, a buffer for me for many, many years. Uh, and of course, my immediate family, my wife and my children, they have supported me through thick and thin. Yes, there are times when you felt that you were left alone to deal with certain situations that you felt the support should have come from higher up in authority. But at the end of the day, I, I think I've overcome. I've overcame many of those challenges. And, and, I, and I'm an example of, in a way, for young people to understand, you know, yes, you could go through certain challenges. And it's, it's at the end of the day, you have to have a grounding, a faith, a belief at the end of the day in who you are. And, and the support around you. Some people don't have that support, but I have. And um, yeah, at the end of the day, it's not just about Trinidad and Tobago. It's um, you know, it being involved in the West Indian community as well. Um, I've had some instances where I felt at one time I wanted to get out of the game because of how I felt I was treated or not treated. And yeah, so you know, all these emotions, all these emotions are still there, mm -hmm. still there. Yeah. And, and Doc, I want to get a comment from you on this as well, because I think the issue of mental health and uh, confidence and, and, and the sort of abuse that, that athletes undergo sometimes from, from the fans, but even in their own performances, you know, we've seen in the past decade where premier athletes have advertised that they have, they are human just like everyone else. Simone Biles, the outstanding U.S. gymnast in Tokyo, um, had a bit of a meltdown. And, and, you know, for a lot of people, they felt it was, wow, <laughs> you know, she's, she's, she's human. She's this great super Olympian gymnast. And there are other, there are other um, cases of this happening as well. So we listened to Gus, and Gus has admitted that there were periods in his career where he felt as if he, he wasn't, wasn't treated well. Was this the essence of you getting together with Gus Logie for the book, Mattering in Caribbean Sport? Absolutely. In fact, I was contacted by a professor in the United Kingdom to find uh, an author in the Caribbean or a writer who would talk about kindness in sport. Kindness. And funny enough, I immediately thought of Coach Gus Logie because we worked together. Yeah. And that was from about 20 17 to, to about 2019 there about and to this day including this morning i got my good morning <laughs> motivation from him and that was something that happened and still happened so yeah. when they ask about you know a, a co-author about um, kindness in sport it was a no-brainer and i also um, observed how he treated the athletes and was like when we were on tours i just looked forward to 
what question are going to ask coach today again and probably hear about his experience during apartheid and what tours would you have been at those, what, what uh, tours would you would have been at because well, to, in the caribbean um new zealand united kingdom and so on so it was a long time on the road and so on so i got to learn more about the history through the great legend there and, and he's so humble with it so it's yeah. very easy to work with him and there but then the same professor who contacted us said it was over a year and nothing had happened. And I said, Coach, you know what? I'm pulling out my chapter, you know. And he said, well, Rosie, if you're doing that, I'm doing the same thing because, you know, it was the two of us. And then we decided we were going to just do it together. And a year and a half later, we are here. Yeah, wow. But kindness does go a far way. So thanks, Coach. I look forward to the message tomorrow. <laughs> you're welcome. You're welcome. Yeah, and one of the things I noticed from the book is the plea for awareness and action. Um, how do we get people to become more aware and how do we get them? As you said, mm -hmm. Coach is very kind and you had those interactions with him. But we live sometimes, and this doesn't happen everywhere, but people are so caught up in their own world, uh, so caught up in social media, so caught up doing whatever they feel is right and everybody is right in their own way. How do you get them to really sit down and think that course of action that somebody else matters and maybe it doesn't take too much out of us to just share a kind word? Yes, sure. I'll let the former athlete answer that one first in terms of the self-awareness. I Coach. mean, Well, I think when once you have influence in your own circles, that's where it starts. Let's put it this way. It starts with your family. It starts with your close friends. It starts with your, in your communities. You might be involved in in different activities in your communities and at the end of the day you're interacting with people all the time and it's about making people feel appreciated you know someone says appreciation of the human mind is everybody wants them to be happy all the time you know at the end of the day if we can give a kind word to a youngster anyone it goes along right now i'm in bermuda as a you know i'm doing some work with some little youngsters and one of the things we keep telling them when you get back home tell your mom tell your dad you love you know, some of themselves will look at you and say, what? <laughs> you know, because it's something strange to some of them, you know, but it's something we have to do. So whatever little circles that we're in and we can influence that circle, we want to influence it in a positive. And I'm certain it will spread. And we're at the introduction of this stage because the concept of mattering is very new, but it's universal. And it's not just for athletes, but in this sphere, it's for athletes and They've been through a lot and people are sometimes unaware of how unkind they've been. And we all, whether you're an athlete or not, bleed red the last time we all checked. <laughs> and so, therefore, we want to matter in to the people that we're representing and mm -hmm. to, you know, those around us. They are, this is not to excuse underperformance, but we are saying we acknowledge what you've done. We acknowledge the sacrifices that you've made, not just at least, but all those who work in the sporting um, industry. Because, like I said, I was uh, privileged to be um, a part of a team where the coach made me feel like I mattered. And that's important because, especially in the Caribbean space, people don't think, a lot of people don't think that this element is so important. And it is because at the, the core of it all, we really want to matter to other people and to ourselves and just to feel like we are appreciated. Yeah, it's important you said that because uh, Doc and uh, Gus could comment on this as well because when I started in this big business in 1984 and the West Indies were, were dominant during that period and Gus was a, a part of that team, I, I recall that a lot of the top players who we considered superstars in the West Indies team said they didn't read the press, they didn't read the editorials about their performances and so on because sometimes it would have a negative impact on 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 their their psyche and um to think that they felt that way then when social media wasn't around no. and i would suggest that public comment on their performances and their value would have increased probably about 150 times <laughs> since 1984 gus I remember Absolutely. some of your teammates saying they didn't read the papers because it, sometimes it, the papers would have said things that they didn't really need to hear in the heat of competition. 
yes, exactly. And, and sometimes it's the negative comments they felt. And, and that's why we never had a relationship. Not many of the, the former players or even some of the present players have this sort of a relationship with the press where they're free to sit down and to discuss things that are affecting them. And I think many things are affecting some of our young players throughout the Caribbean and possibly throughout the world, but they don't have that support around them as possibly other countries have. You, you see the, the, the team set up and you see all the different psychologists, you see all the different you know, mental skills people working with our young people to build them up, with, keep their self-confidence going so that they can interface not only with the opposition, but also with press and, or, and, and, and stuff. So they get gain confidence, they get composure when they get out there in the middle. They're not afraid, they're not intimidated. Mm. So again, you know, it is a fact that over the years we have not had, you know, that kind of relationship. And therefore, so many stories have never been told. And, you know, so many of our young people have not been able to benefit from so many of the great players' experiences on and off the field. Yeah. I want to add to this discussion, though, Doc, and I think I have to say this as a journalist and a broadcaster, that sometimes... Um, uh, an analyst may suffer because of comments they have made about a, a particular player. Now, we are doing our job, so if a player underperforms, the, the, it, the, public, the public expects us to speak honestly. And I must say that there are times we say things about a player, not with any malice or rancor, but an honest assessment of a player. Mm -hmm. And then we get this 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 backlash that the player doesn't want to talk to us because they heard that we said something negative about them on on ear which i mean i have to defend the, the 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 journalist here because we are in the business of saying you know the truth the, the truth yeah. so how 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 would you respond to something like that because it's a fact that there are athletes who don't want to talk to certain journalists because I they guess. were deemed to have said something that wasn't positive. Yeah. But our job is not to speak positively. Our job is to speak analytically. Yeah, we're not motivational speakers. <laughs> I get that. Thank you so much for that. But at the same time, that's a tricky space to navigate because yes. everybody is doing his or her job, yeah. right? But at the same time, there athletes have been trained to know that same element that, hey, in the professional realm, this is what will happen. So there are times when we have to um, replay a performance and I'm there with them and some will ask for the comments or the commentary to be muted, right? Because you don't want <laughs> to be going that. through, I didn't know right? That. Yes. So, so that happens and that's a way in which we improvise where everybody is doing his or her job, right? Yeah. To ensure that you get the kind of feedback that is necessary. But also sometimes it's, it's stretched a little bit too much, and it's not necessarily the journalists who are doing it. And sometimes, sometimes you are presenting a side or, or explaining on, on the performance, and this is good feedback if it's done in a particular way. But there are so many different particular ways that everybody wants it to be done, and you're not going to be able to cater to all of that. So as a result, the athlete is taught different coping mechanisms to block out. Some people hand over their phone immediately, you know, or, this, or ask not to be told what is said because also they have family members who will want to defend them. So even if they themselves didn't hear the comment or re they, they didn't read it or anything, somebody is there to inform them. And once you get that information, you cannot unget it, you know. So it's already yeah. there. It's, you know, oh, let me see which journalist said that. Okay, I'm not doing interview. With them. So people react based on emotions yes. sometimes, but... I mean, in the professional space of sports, there are some journalists that when I'm going to be interviewed by them, I'm like, oh boy, this is going to be a tough one. But there are some that, you know, it's people, everybody's just doing their job. But again, it is the way in which it's done. And there are little um, notions of appreciation because even after the interviews, people can still say a kind word. Yeah. There must be something that you can, can say that is still factual, that is accurate. Yeah. So it's just about finding that balance and ensuring that you know we're not so hostile but in fan mode that's easy to say because i remember watching um t20 just recently and i i messaged same coach goes and I, I told him how i felt and he said rosie remember we talk about mattering in sport right so in fan <laughs> mode you're like why are you not doing that you, you 
you forget. But at the same time, it's really how we treat people beyond the, the, the field, beyond the court, beyond the track, yeah. and just treat them with respect. Because especially when they're in lines purchasing different things, nobody wants to hear which cat they had dropped and all that kind of thing. It's just timing, you know. And then it's not like they are not also displeased about their performance. So don't yeah. think you want to win more than they do. Yeah. So when you go now and you constantly remind them or say some very, you know, harsh things to them, that's the part that's showing that you are being deliberately not so nice. Mm. Yeah. Well, Lance, you know, we have a lot of what you call evidence the just concluded World Cup from the teams that many people expected to qualify did not qualify or did not even make the Super 8s, the Pakistan yeah. team, for instance. They, if you can go on the social media, you will see this, the type of rhetoric and the type of discussions. Uh, read the captain, some of the senior players, they're even threatening lawsuits, you know, because it's not only affecting them personally, it's affecting their families because the attack has gone further than the individual themselves, you know. so. It's something that maybe we in the Caribbean uh, sort of became sort of insulated from because our team, um, you know, did not make it to um, the semifinal, which many people expected. But I haven't heard any kind of negative um, feedback from the general public or even from the journalists as to, you know, some of our players. I know they are hurting and I don't know what kind of support they are getting at this point in time because I'm certain some of them mentally are hurting because they felt that they could have won the World Cup at home. You know, so that is a, a, a issue as well that, you know, they will have to deal. Yeah. But I'm hoping that they have some support. Yeah. Okay, um, Gus, we're going to leave it there. We want to thank you and Dr. Olivia Rose for um, having this discussion with us. A very, very important um, discussion, I think. Of course, the book authored by yourself and uh, Dr. Rose, Caribbean or Mattering in Caribbean Sport, is available on Amazon. Um, so we would like, you know, all the, the viewers and fans of sport to, to have a read because it is an aspect of sport that I think uh, people need to embrace because the mental health and comfort of our stars in sport, no matter what the sport is, I think would be considered important to everyone. So I think this was a pertinent discussion that we've had on The Zone today. Uh, Gus, um, great talking to you for the first time in many years, sir. In many uh, years, yes, yes, yes. I'm doing my bit in the background for, for, for tourism in Bermuda. I see the lovely beaches. Yes. <laughs> so please, I'm, I'm inviting all of you, all of Jamaica, after the hurricane, come to Bermuda. Yes. Enjoy, in, enjoy a little bit of heaven. Uh, all right, Gus, thanks. Thank you. And, and Doc, thanks for, for dropping you. by, uh, making the Take latest care. of her many appearances on the Sports Smack Zone. Um, for the first time, though, Here. from this venue yeah. in our spanking studio, which we uh, arrived in in September of last year. Yeah. We have more to come on the Sportsmat Zone back after this.